it's a real honor and pleasure to introduce Gerald Pollack. He's a researcher uh, at University of Washington in Seattle, and he's just a man of many talents and many things. He's the editor in chief of Water Magazine. He runs an annual conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water. Uh, he's also the executive director of the Institute for Venture Science. And I think he's really bringing to light one of the most important discoveries of our generation. Uh, you know, water is something that we still have so much to learn from. And in many ways, it's been overlooked time and time again through history. And Gerald is doing an amazing job at really clearly articulating uh, some of these lesser known qualities of water and really finding new qualities of water that help explain the natural phenomenon that we see. Um, so welcome, Gerald. It's really an honor to have you here. Well, thank you. And thank you for that wonderful introduction, which I certainly don't deserve. <laughs> oh, you absolutely do. And so for people that are totally new uh, to this concept of that there's a fourth phase of water or exclusion zone, easy water, can you give people just a basic overview of, of what you've discovered here and what your work helped highlight? We discovered uh, that water has a, a, a phase uh, beyond the three that we ordinarily think of, you know, the solid, liquid, and vapor. And um, we, we actually stand on, this is, this is not completely original, we, our work stands on the shoulders of giants. And one of those giants was a guy named Gilbert Ling, who passed at age 100 uh, a few years back. And, um, and Ling was not a, a nobody, so to speak. He was chosen, there was a cohort of young researchers uh, coming coming from China after World War II, 1948. And for the first cohort, they chose three. They looked all over China to, to, to find the three most talented people, one in physics, one in chemistry, and it was Ling who was in, in biology. The guy, uh, the, the physics uh, uh, person they chose went on to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, the chemist was uh, very prominent and um, uh, my student, who's Chinese, tells me he also won a Nobel Prize, but I'm not sure. And Gilbert Ling did not win a Nobel Prize. He was very controversial, and um, and many people think he should have won two Nobel Prizes, or or maybe even more. Anyway, he he was um, for me. That's where everything started. We had been in a different field, and um, it was actually the field of muscle contraction, trying to figure out how the proteins interacted. Uh, in the muscle to bring about uh, contraction. Um, and someone told me that um, I ought to go to a meeting in Hungary. And the meeting was to commemorate to commemorate the, the life uh, of a, a famous biophysicist. Uh, and, and, um, and I was to, whose interest was muscle contraction and water. So I was to represent muscle contraction. I went, I delivered my talk. But uh, what really amazed me uh, was the people I met there dealing with water. And the main person was that one, Gilbert uh, Ling, who presented a, an overview of the work that he had done in the past, uh, many, many decades of work. And it was also supported by, um, by uh, perhaps a dozen other researchers who had supportive evidence. And and the main theme that I'm talking about, which is what got us started, is that he thought he thought that the water inside the cell, he had a lot of evidence, it's not just that he thought, the water inside the cell was not um, like um, like this, water in a glass. You know, and, and the water in a glass, the molecules are bouncing around a fierce number of times per second, and they're all randomly distributed, randomly oriented. And he said, no, it's it's not like that inside the cell. Inside the cell, um, the molecules of water are lined up like soldiers at attention. And and he had a good rationale uh, for this. Um, if you think of the water molecule as a as a dipole, you know, like a bean with plus at one end, minus at the other, you can imagine those those beans stacking on one another, where the plus of one sticks to the minus of its neighbor. And and Gilbert. Gilbert said, um, well, this stacking phenomenon, this order 
uh, it, it, it's not just two or three, uh, not just a, a depth of two or three molecules from from a surface, uh, but actually it could be hundreds even. And we found hundreds of thousands um, uh, la later on. So, so he was on to something, and um, and I was sure he was on to something because it just rang. It had the ring of truth uh, to it. So much evidence and so much logic to it. So I I went home um, and um, uh, really eager uh, to to begin studies in this intriguing area because you know it it was pretty clear that if he was right, everybody else was wrong. And um, and the understanding of how cells function needed to to take a uh, an abrupt turn in a, in a different direction. We had no money uh, to study the water. We had money to study muscles, and I must admit that uh, shifting a few dollars here and there. But anyway, the first thing that I did was to write a book, and it was called "Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life." And the purpose of the book, the purpose of the book was was to um, to provide some understanding of Ling's ideas. That was the book's main purpose. Um, Gilbert didn't like it, by the way, because he felt it stole his thunder, but that's another <laughs> another, another story. Um, so um, it received mixed reviews. Some re reviews said, oh, you know, this is more, more of Gilbert Ling. We're tired of this. Gilbert Ling, everybody knows he's a crackpot, so forget about it. Uh, to to the other extreme, where there, there were some pretty pretty hefty positive reviews. One one coming from a cell biologist from Harvard. And if it's from Harvard, of course we have to believe it because it's Harvard. So so he said this is a three hundred and four page uh, preface to the future of cell biology. Well, I like that one. <laughs> At any rate. Um, we started we started doing experiments and um I, I'm sorry for this long introduction but you know I've got to tell you how all of this started it, it was not something pulled out of thin air um so we were we were really eager to do experiments and I had just gone through I had just gone through the the process of giving one of Ling's books to a few of my students and postdocs um and they came back uh, to me with a uniform uh, response, and the response was amazing. Uh, if this guy is right, and it looks like he might well be right, then everything everything in cell biology has to change. So naturally, <laughs> it was so tempting, it was difficult, difficult to avoid plunging into the water, so to speak. And um, and so we did. And so, so I give this as, as background. Uh, the first thing we did and and this this gets to the fourth phase or easy one. The first thing we did um, was to try 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 to find this region of structure of water structure that Ling um, had provided evidence. And and uh, before I forget, let me say that we we did confirm some of Ling, but we found some features that are markedly different from what Ling had suggested. Features that I think are critically important for an understanding of of nature. So with that that said, the first thing we did was to to, to look for the, this kind of uh, ordered water. Now, when you have ordering like that, the molecules are lined up. When molecules are lined up, it's like a crystal, actually a liquid crystal. And um, to obtain a liquid crystal, you know, the, the original material has to be cleared of contaminants because if it has contaminants, it's not pure. So it has to exclude the contaminants as the crystal forms. So we were looking for um, uh, a region of water that would exclude uh, contaminants. So we 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 added contaminants. Um, we we used uh, microspheres, little tiny spheres that are routinely used in in science um, in suspension of water, and into the water, the chamber of water, we plunked a small gel. Uh, uh, as a as a kind of nucleating surface for something that that might exist, uh, um, the word nucleating seems to confuse. But um, uh, initiating surface or important surface or or whatever, I like the term nucleating. Um, so, and 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 we looked in the microscope, and 
well, lo and behold, next to the gel, all sides of the gel, uh, from the surface of the gel, we found that the microspheres were getting excluded. And it was a progressive effect. And the, the progressive effect went on for, for um, oh, maybe 10 minutes, and then it ceased. And after that 10 minutes, we could see that those zones right adjacent to the gel, uh, those zones were devoid, completely devoid of microspheres. And the size was impressive. Um, it was two tenths of a millimeter just to start with. And, and later, you know, over the years that we did experiments, we found um, easily up to one millimeter. You could see it with your naked eye, though it was easier to see in the microscope. We could see one millimeter. And in, in certain circumstances, we could actually see the uh, so-called exclusion zone, which is what we called it because it excludes. There's a zone of water that excludes. We could see this zone extending way out as much as a meter. Uh, so th this is um, this is not a trivial thing. It's a, it's it's actually a, um, a ma major event. And so so of course we were keen to study it in in more detail. We called it exclusion zone at first because because it excluded. It was actually the advice of, of an Australian colleague, John Watterson, who said, you got to give it a name. You can't you can't sort of wave your hands and describe it. He called it something. And exclusion zone was perfect because EZ, you see, it works beautifully, easy to remember uh, uh, in the US, but of course in Europe and other places, it would be EZ and it doesn't work. <laughs> so, but anyway, we called it exclusion zone and later, after we studied the properties of, of this zone, we found that the, the properties bore almost no relation to ordinary water. Uh, everything we measured was different, uh, everything we could measure. And, and so after we, we came to realize that this ordered zone, um, um, uh, and we knew it, it was ordered because by refringence measurements actually done by a Russian group, uh, showed order. That's how you measure order. So, but but every property of this was different from from ordinary liquid water, and so we then began calling it fourth phase water. So easy water, fourth phase, same thing. And I use those terms interchangeably; they're the same. So um, one of the, um, I, I guess uh, there are maybe a couple of major features of this that I I should mention. Um, um, one one is the electrical charge. Now, water is neutral, and we had every reason to uh, to expect that this region would be neutral, and that's what Gilbert Ling would have. You know, you could you can stack dipoles from from Seattle to the moon, and you would never, um, if you could, <laughs> you never get um, any any net charge. It should be zero. So we happen to. Um, um, I, I happen to have a lot of experience with electrodes, with micro electrodes, incidentally, parenthetically, um, invented by the same Gilbert Ling. Um, there are glass electrodes filled with concentrated potassium chloride solution, and the glass tapers to a very fine tip. So you can you can stick those electrodes into cells um, and take them out, and the cell won't die. They're so tiny, um, and and. You know, it, it seemed well. Let's 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 see what happens if we stick it into the exclusion zone. So we stick one electrode in the exclusion zone, another electrode way beyond the exclusion zone, so we can measure a potential difference. You know, you got to have a reference electrode, and lo and behold, the EZ was negatively charged. Uh, it was a complete shock, so to speak, uh, <laughs> that it should be negatively charged. Why? Why negatively charged? Anyway. We've measured this over and over, including up to today, uh, and we 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 find negative charge. Parenthetically, some surfaces show positive, but they're pretty rare and and uh, sort of an exception. So let me let me forget about that for the moment. But in biology, it's all negative, so to speak. <laughs> uh, I don't like the word negative. It's too bad that Benjamin Franklin. Um, uh, use the term negative to describe the charge of electrons. If he had said positive, everything would fit so much, <laughs> so much better. But anyway, so so we found it's negative. Now, if you think about it, uh, 
this doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't make sense because you started with water. The water is neutral. So if you find a big zone that's negative, it implies that you know there's got to be another zone of positive because otherwise it doesn't make any sense since you started with something neutral. So we looked and we found that the positive charge um, was situated just beyond the exclusion zone. So the exclusion zone is negative and the region beyond the exclusion zone is positive. That means you got a battery, uh, minus, plus. And we confirmed proof of principle that it is a battery from which you can actually get electrical energy. So we, we put two electrodes in, one in the EZ, the other one in the positive zone beyond, connected it to an LED, and we could get the LED to light, which means <laughs> there must have been current flow, uh, and the current flow came from the battery-like feature of that potential difference. And that implied that uh, wherever you have easy water, you've got energy supply. And we found later, if you if you ask me, uh, an example uh, in the uh, cardiovascular system uh, in in which this energy is actually used. So so it's it's kind of energy that biology uses, and um, it may use more than than we think at first. Uh, it may be a really important um, energetic feature. So just one more thing before we before before I finish my speech. <laughs> Um, I didn't mean to give a speech, but you know, you you open the door with your key. So so here we are. So um, as you know, you can't get something for nothing. It doesn't work. Even in Seattle, it doesn't work. And and so you got a battery, but how did you get that battery? And the battery contains energy. You can't create energy. This is a foundational principle in physics, which I you know believe makes sense. And history has shown that. And all you can do is convert one kind of energy to another kind of energy. Like, um, for example, heat runs the steam engine, which produces a mechanical effect. So um, heat energy turns into mechanical energy. Um, that's just just one example. So we're we're thinking, where where does the energy come from to build this battery? It was not at all obvious. And, um, you know, I... I was scratching my head uh, for quite a while. That's why you don't see so much hair uh, over there, trying to figure out you know, what, what the hell is going on here? Where does the energy come from to create this battery? Um, and finally, uh, we had a hint early on uh, when one of the senior scientists in my lab, um, uh, he, he was called away suddenly from his experiment and he left the microscope light on overnight, and he found that the exclusion zone had grown enormously. Uh, and so, you know, we, it, it seemed that maybe since the microscope light caused it to expand, maybe the growth of the EZ had to do with light. Uh, and and we, we, we dropped it because at that time, um, it was just a casual observation, and I think we didn't have the people power to pursue it. But then, a few years later, an undergraduate student uh, was in the lab, and you know, a young, inexperienced student, and he's he's working with a chamber similar to the chamber I I described to you, and right next to him was a gooseneck lamp, so he picks up the lamp, shines it on the chamber, and um, and then calls me in from my office, so I. I scurry into the laboratory, and he says, "Hey, look at this." And what he what he had shown is that the region of the exclusion zone that was illuminated had grown enormously, and the other regions that were not illuminated didn't grow. So again, you know, did, didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out <laughs> figure out that hey, you know, light may be important. And so we went on to do real experiments. Uh, by some senior people in the lab to find out uh, which wavelength of light. You know, a lamp contains many wavelengths ranging from at the short wavelength and from ultraviolet uh, to medium, which would be the visible spectral range. And then um, uh, beyond that, the long wavelengths would be the infrared, the longer wavelengths than red. Um, and the results were clear. Um, um, the ultraviolet did nothing to expand the EZ. 
uh, visible light did nothing to expand the EZ, except toward the longer wavelengths, we could pick up a little bit of expansion when we got to the to red, but infrared, just beyond the red, it was like gangbusters. Uh, uh, very, very weak infrared light um, could build the exclusion zone by up to 10 times. Uh, I mean, really, really weak light. And so it became clear that that it's infrared light that builds uh, there's the energy uh, that that builds this battery uh, and that was cool you know because the result was clear and uh, and, and and definitive uh, so a lot of people don't don't know about infrared light you know we, we all we all kind of know that when you when you uh, push the toaster uh, the lever down and and the coils begin to light up and glow uh, uh, beautiful orange, um, and it's hot. And we say, oh, it's generating infrared energy or infrared light or the same thing, um, radiant energy. Yeah, we all, we all kind of know that. But actually, it turns out that uh, infrared light exists everywhere. And, and so if, uh, if in, 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 your, in your studio or room or uh, otherwise, if you turn off all the lights can't see anything um and even even your camera your cell phone camera with its exquisite sensitivity can't record anything um if you instead take out an infrared camera which is pretty much the same as an ordinary camera but the sensor is sensitive to infrared instead of visible light um then you can get a beautiful image of um of those books behind you, the shelves, the posts, the door, the picture, even you. And that's why that's why the military uses it at night to to look for the enemy's tanks uh, and and et cetera. It's it's very effective. What that means is that this energy is everywhere. Um, it's not it's not just the toaster coil or the oven uh, coil uh, or the sun. Um, it's everywhere. And so because it's everywhere and because that's the energy that's required to build easy water, um, easy water is almost always present uh, uh, under the right circumstances. So just, just to summarize, um, um, easy produces a battery. Um, the battery can actually be useful in biology and the battery is charged by infrared light. I think I'll stop there because I don't mean for this to be a speech. Uh, that was a fantastic introduction to all of it for the people that this is a new concept. And just to put an exclamation point on it, I find it just so incredible that in a way it seems like you've almost stumbled upon the energy of life in this electrical potential that happens along these hydrophilic surfaces. And it reminds me of a friend of mine studies extremophiles uh, with a look to how to identify extraterrestrial life. If it's so dissimilar to us, how would we identify it? And he, his summary of that process is that you would find it by finding an electrical gradient that you wouldn't otherwise expect. And so in a way, it's kind of incredible that by that definition, water has these life qualities to it, just in its interaction in nature. Um, uh, that's fantastic. I, I, I hadn't known about that. And, and, you know, it makes total sense uh, for me, uh, but not only because of the water, but, you know, if you just think about it, um, so an everyday event is the measurement of your electrocardiogram, electro, uh, or electroencephalogram, uh, electrical. And you can measure electrical potentials other ways around around the body. It's always there, and um, we we've we've actually bypassed um, that um, uh, understanding by thinking that everything in the body is purely chemical. In fact, a good deal of it is actually electrical, and the electrical basis is much more important than thought. So I. I, I, I agree with you, Zach. I think you're really on to something with that. And it, you know, this all, it has some major implications here. I mean, one that water has this alternate phase 
another that water stores energy. And these are all summarized really well in your book, um, that water gets that energy from light as well. And so you start to see a really cohesive picture that to me also looks like it has a lot of the ingredients of photosynthesis. And as we unpack that process, I wonder, can you share a bit on how this understanding of easy water informs our understanding of the photosynthetic process? I can try. I don't know if I'll succeed, uh, but uh, but yeah, exactly. So step one, photosynthesis has, I think, 20 steps or something like that, most of which are not clear. Um, but step one is, is a critical one. And and step one, in step one, light comes in to the plant, and the plant receives the light. And then in the presence of chlorophyll and chloroplasts, um, the water, the light coming in, splits the water into positive and negative. And the rest of the steps of photosynthesis depend on that critical step of taking the water and splitting it in, into positive and negative, parenthesis, sort of like what we found. Um, <laughs> Uh, however, <laughs> there, there's one issue that, as far as I can see, has never been addressed. So if you split the water molecule into uh, positive and negative, uh, what do the positive and negative want to do? They want to recombine instantly because they attract each other. But that doesn't work because photosynthesis depends on, <laughs> on the fact that you've got plus and minus separated, but there's no mechanism of separation. Um, and this is, a, this is a big obstacle. And so the possibility is that the separation occurs in the same way that I've been discussing, uh, that it has to do with easy water, but it had not been recognized in the process of photosynthesis that it's a necessary condition that you need something to keep the positive separated from the negative. And the ED, EZ does that. And the reason it does it um, is has to do with the EZ, uh, the structural lattice um, of the EZ. It's a tightly packed lattice. It consists of sheets stacked upon one another. The first sheet would be adjacent to, to the nucleating or hydrophilic surface that you need to initiate the growth of this. And the second one uh, piles on top of the first and the third on top of the second and so on. So you've got a stack of sheets like a ream of paper. Um, in each sheet, uh, the structure is a honeycomb, in other words, adjacent hexagons. Um, and um, and those holes are pretty small, uh, the hexagon, hexagonal uh, uh, spaces. Not only that, but, but um, 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 successive sheets are actually shifted by half of the, uh, of the spacing of those hexagons. So, so you'd, you'd be, the, the, you'd be encountering, if you want to pass through the hex, hex, hexagon, um, it wouldn't be the full hexagon, it would be like half a hexon that's available for you to pass through. So now uh, I'm, now I'm getting, getting to the point. Um, one point is that those openings are small. The second is that when the proton, the positive charge, is kicked out of the growing EZ, it, it immediately it attaches to a water molecule to to create a hydronium ion and chemists know this is standard uh, chemists know that you got hydronium ions that that is um, positively charged water so in other words as the protein get proton gets kicked out it suddenly becomes much more massive because originally with a proton but now it's sticking to uh, it's hanging on to a water molecule so the species now is much larger now, this positive species wants desperately to mate with the EZ. But in order to do that, it's got to go through the hexagonal opening. And that opening is small. So the positive charge is large, uh, larger, and the opening is small, a smaller, and it simply can't penetrate. Uh, so it's obstructed. And that's why the positive, although it would dearly love to mate with the negative, can't do that stays out and so they remain separated so i can't sort of guarantee that this is the way it works although it seems to me that this is the way it works but there's a suggestion that this same um, um, understanding might apply in photosynthesis because you need to keep <laughs> keep the plus and minus from 
recombining with one another one way or another so that's a really good point that you that you mentioned and uh, and also um, you know if if you think about photosynthesis it 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 begins to apply in earnest in the springtime when it gets warm when it gets warm it means there's more infrared energy if there's more infrared energy you know it powers all the processes that we're talking about so so it makes i think i think it makes re reasonable sense that that what that photosynthesis is one example of a more generic mechanism similar to one that, that we studied but and probably uh, the most efficient or effective one uh, because nature you know nature doesn't fool around mother, mother nature is wise <laughs> and she knows how to build systems that are optimized and that's why i think many people consider the first step of photosynthesis to be 100 percent efficient so does that answer your question yeah that does a fantastic job and it it never ceases to amaze me how this way of looking at water starts to provide some very simple clear answers for some very big questions that we don't really have answers for otherwise uh, and another one of those that again happens in the spring um, that i find really fascinating is the moisture transport water transport in trees how these redwoods can pull this water up way high into their crowns you know, more so than you think might be possible. Um, and you've discovered some really interesting stuff with the movement of water through nafion tubes and how that correlates to potentially the movement of water through xylem tubes in plants. I wonder, can you bring that to life, what you found with nafion tubes and how that might relate to uh, water transport in trees? Sure. Um yeah, well, it it actually started with Nafion. I don't know the correct pronunciation, Nafion, Nafion, but whatever. It's probably not mine. I would imagine I, you're I, right there. I, I, I don't know. We refer to it as Nafion, but uh, we've done it. Uh, we've done the, the same thing uh, with other kinds of tubes. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but yeah, so what we did is we took a Nafion tube and we immersed it in water, actually in a suspend water with suspended microspheres because and we could see what was going on because you can track the microspheres, but you can't track the water um, in, a, in a microscope. So um, um, so one, one of the students uh, did this. He took, he took the Nafion tube, a, a short segment of tube, a cylindrical tube, and he immersed it in the water in the horizontal uh, uh, mode. And, he came in one day uh, to tell me, you know, the students, students are usually uh, polite, especially the Asian uh, students. And he was, he came from an Asian uh, family and um, um, he barged into my office and they don't, they're usually, I usually leave the door cracked open a little bit because I encourage them, the students to come in and, you know, a chat, tell me what they found. But he came barging in and I was in the middle of a conversation with some guy I don't remember who it was, but it was not particularly interesting. So uh, I was really happy that the student came in, but uh, you know he apologized. He said, "Well, I, you know, I, I have to tell you something I observed," and um, uh, and I, I pretended to be a little irritated because he broke in on a um, a meeting, but actually I wasn't. I was kind of happy. So uh, shame on me. Uh, anyway, he said, "You know, I immersed the tube in water, and I noticed that." there was flow flowing right through the tube and it never stops. It just kept flowing through the tube. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is, uh, this is if true. And we, we actually did follow-up studies and we found that it certainly is true. And then um, it's interesting because the question is, where does the energy come from? Uh, usually if you drive, if you drive fluid through a tube, you know, you need a pressure gradient. You need, like, for example, the heart, the ventricle is creating pressure, which sends it, uh, the blood through the aorta and, and the, the other vessels. Uh, pressure is what drives it. But there's this horizontal tube. There's no difference of pressure from one side, one end to the other end. And so I'm thinking we had just identified infrared energy uh, as as being a possible source so we're thinking maybe somehow infrared energy is driving the whole process and it turns out it's true so we look more carefully and 
And what we found was the following. Just inside the tube, uh, there was um, an annular ring that formed of EZ water, actually just outside the tube too. But um, the one just inside the tube, so you know, you got a negatively charged uh, EZ, that, a ring that ran just inside the tube. And of course, when you have negative EZ, you got positive, and the positive was sitting in the core of the tube. So the negative EZ sticks uh, to the uh, inside surface of the nafion tube, and the protons are freely, uh, freely dissolved, or hydronium ions, I should say, are freely dissolved in the water. They repel each other. Uh, as the repulsion builds up, they want to get out. They want to get away from each other. They, they don't like to be in the vicinity of each other. So they were going to exit either one end or the other end of the tube. And, um, um, and, and, and as, for example, if, um, if the hydronium ions uh, exit uh, on the right end, then new water will come in on the left end to replace it. And the process is perpetuated. And as long as there's infrared energy around, which there is, um, the process is going to keep going. So now if you, if you think about the tubes, like the xylem tube um, inside the redwood tree or you know, any other plants or trees, you know, you think of a long tube. And if you think of the tube, if you think of a 300 foot uh, tube filled with water, the pressure at the bottom is enormous, uh, right? Uh, 300, <laughs> a sta 300 feet tall water, but yet the water manages to go up uphill, you know, to the crown and 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 out. So this has been a, a a puzzle that's been debated for years and years. But we're thinking that the a process similar to what we found in the lab. And by the way, if you take that 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 tube, that Nafion tube, and other tubes we subsequently other kinds and turn it vertically, we found that it still it still does its job. So so this looks like it 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 looks like um uh, like this is the mechanism this is the reason um why water can actually go up because there is a driving energy and that driving energy ultimately is infrared energy so does that um answer your question uh yeah, that does a terrific job. And it, you know, it kind of brings us to a next point, which is how this same phenomenon or process we can see observed mirrored in our own bodies with the circulation of blood and with also where, you know, once the heart stops, the blood continues to flow for some period of time afterwards. Um, so what what can we help understand about our own health from this same uh, process? Well, I'm happy you asked asked that question because you know very few people know what you just said that when you stop the heart, um, um, the blood continues to flow at low low velocity, and um, and that that was actually identified um, or. Uh, my student who was doing some experiments did a literature search and he found a half dozen papers that presented this same result that you mentioned uh, over a period of a hundred years. Nobody paid attention to it because you'd think, well, everybody knows that that the blood is driven by the heart and you, if you stop the heart, the blood should stop. Blood flow should stop, but it doesn't. It goes on for some some substantial period of time. You know, which is completely unexpected. And by the way, parenthetically, one wonders about the definition of death. <laughs> you know, is it when your heart stops or when the blood stops flowing or whatever? But anyway, when the heart, if if it's true that when the heart stops beating, uh, the blood continues to flow, then you know it's pretty obvious that that there must be some other mechanism besides the heart that drives the flow. And um, so I actually found out about this. It was about maybe eight or nine years ago. It was a visit to Moscow to visit my friend and colleague, Vladimir Vyakov uh, from Moscow University. He heads or, or deputy head of the, of the biochemistry department and a very astute guy. Uh, but I, I went to see him and he quickly um, introduced me to, to the guy who had a lab down the hall. He said, you really need to listen to this guy. So the guy came in, translated, everything translated by Vladimir. 
And the guy is telling me, there's a big problem in the cardiovascular system. So my immediate reaction, uh, since I did my PhD thesis on pressures and flows in the cardiovascular system, and I thought we had it all worked out, my first reaction was, oh, come on, what are you going to tell me that I don't already know? Um, well, within five minutes, he had me convinced that he was right. Uh, and uh, it was not the argument that you brought forth uh, uh, about that flow continues when the heart stops. But he had another point of view um, that in, from which he could draw, draw the same conclusion. He said, um, think about the capillaries, Jerry. He said, think about the capillaries. The small, smallest capillaries are on the order, the inside diameter is like three or four micrometers. You know, they're really small. But red cells, red blood cells need to pass through those capillaries, and they're twice the diameter. They're like six or seven uh, micrometers. So in order for something to happen, those red blood cells, which sort of look like donuts, um, you know, with with material in the hole, and the material, a little bit of hole, they got to be squeezed or bent or something. And you can see this bending in videos of blood flowing through capillaries. It's absolutely true. He said, he said, the bending requires energy, and it requires a lot of energy. And he he did his own calculations. Of course, we never know if the calculation is correct, but according to his calculation, um, if the ventricle alone were responsible for driving the blood uh, uh, through the vessels, in order to do the squeezing, um, it would need to develop an enormous pressure, something like, he said, like a million times the pressure that it actually develops. I guess in Russia, they have a lot of high blood pressure, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, a million times is too much. Even if he's off by, you know, a factor of 10 or even 100, so we're, we're down to 10,000 times, uh, you know, it, something's going on there because it, the ventricle does not produce enough pressure to, to create all of this bending, which is observed. So, so there's got to be another, another source of energy. And uh, so he's... He's talking about uh, bubbles and other possible reasons why you could get energy. And I'm thinking, um, um, shame on me, thinking something different and not perhaps listening as well as I should have. We just found that infrared energy um, is, is in, in, involved. And in fact, it, it drives, it can drive water through tubes, through hydrophilic water loving material. As, which the vessels are of, of of tubes, and I'm thinking, hey, why not the same principle applied in the cardiovascular system? Uh, isn't it possible that the same thing that drives water up to the top of a redwood tree is enough to drive blood through capillaries? That that was the way of thinking. So um, I went home, and um, um, I, I I usually when I when I get an idea, I try it out on some of my students. And so I tried it out on one student. Um, his name is Zheng Li. And in fact, um, I wanted him to pursue this, to actually do an experiment to see if if that supposition might be accurate. He told me after, when he found that it was, he told me after that when I first suggested it to him, he thought I was in some kind of drug. <laughs> it didn't make, you know, it's a, a wild hypothesis, uh, but, but so he did the experiment. Um, um, he was duly compliant with the boss, <laughs> although I don't have a tendency to say, you must do this. It's not like that. We, we usually discuss things and we mutually um, agree on a project. And that's that's usually how it works. Um, anyway, he took um, a chick embryo. In other words, if, and you know, you three days old, and you you can lop off the top of the egg, uh, the fertilized egg, and by three days you can see the full cardiovascular system, um, and 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 also it's it, it, it's not there hasn't been enough development for the neurological regulatory system and the hormonal system to have developed. So it's pretty pure. It's just the vessels, uh, pretty pretty to a first approximation. So he tested the hypothesis um, <clears throat> that that blood flow in 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 this system um, um, would be uh, impacted by infrared energy. In other words, if you apply infrared energy, the blood flow should 
substantially the flow should increase. And he did the experiment and he found exactly that. He found that that um, by applying infrared energy, um, uh, he, he could easily get an increase of three times or something like that. Um, and that, that is after he stopped the heart. It, so, so he first stops the heart and then flow continues. Um, and, and he asked the question whether the mechanism, whatever it is, that would drive this residual flow after the heart is stopped, um, is it sensitive to infrared in, in the way that we surmise? That's a kind of signature feature. Of, and the answer was yes. And, and the finding was just published a few months ago. Um, after a lot of journals, uh, <laughs> this is part of the system, um, a lot of journals rejected it. And, um, and in, in most cases, it was rejected before a review. They just didn't like the idea, it's too radical an idea. They said, this is not for our journal. And I, I, won't, I won't venture to tell you how many times that happened, but it happened many times. Um, and finally, it was published uh, with suitable revision and, and such. And so, so it looks like um, um, the idea the idea uh, that energy, that infrared energy, and that EZ properties uh, effectively are, are are working, it applies also not only trees uh, uh, and photosynthesis, but also it applies in uh, in the cardiovascular system, which you know, which means that you and I, it's not just the heart that runs that runs our cardiovascular system; it's also the vessels themselves that do it. So it's it's a kind of revolutionary, and we haven't proved it. Uh, our results are only consistent with the possibility that, that that's the case. So that that's been fun. <laughs> and that's just so radical and eye opening. And that brings up a point that I want to come back to that I think is very important about you know the evolution of science and and peer reviewed science. Um, but there's one thing that is a pattern that I just really enjoy uh, that I want to share with, with the listeners and you that I see that the people who really look to nature for truth and look to that with an open mind, they come at it from all these different angles, but they find things that are very similar. And so it was really interesting to me hearing you talk about the heart and blood flow it reminds me of something I've heard Ernst Ghosh say, who's a centropic agriculture practitioner, uh, but he said, the heart is not the pump, it sets the rhythm. And now I don't know if he's familiar with all of the other backstory that you share, but when I hear those two statements, they're, they're very much aligned towards the same thing. Um, and so I wonder when you hear that the heart is not the pump, but rather it sets the rhythm. Does that sound accurate to you with your understanding or any thoughts that come up from that? Well, it certainly sets the rhythm. Um, uh, you know, that's pretty self-evident. But, I, I, you know, there are a lot of people who are talking about the fact that the heart is not a pump. And it um, starts with Rudolf Steiner, for example. Um, uh, and I, that, I find that hard to understand because demonstrably the heart generates pressure. It's a muscle, and when muscles contract, you got force. And uh, and if you have a let's say a, a cylindrical uh, vessel, which you could say the heart is a cylindrical or or a spherical vessel or something, you know it the muscle that is on the periphery it contracts and it builds pressure. And so I, I can't understand why you would say that's not a pump. Uh, I would suggest that it's not the only pump. <laughs> um, now, that's but, different uh, from, from from that. So I, I don't have much more to say about about the viewpoint that you that you attributed to. I, I, I forget the name of the scientist, but but um, as far as I can see, the heart is a pump. It generates pressure. And the reason and the pressure that it generates is not nearly enough to run the show, uh, but it sets the direction of, of the flow. Remember, I. I, I talked about the tube that's uh, immersed in the water and 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 the pressure that builds from the repulsion of protons. So it could go out this side or this side. In the cardiovascular system, you want it to go one way. And I think one purpose of, of the pressure developed by the heart is to direct that flow in the proper direction. That's how I see it. 
Um, and my ideas could be way off base, but that's how I see it. Uh, that's fascinating. That's a really nice addition. And, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you spoke to something else there that is, I think, a really important piece that we also really see going on right now, I think, with um, just how reductionistic science can get and how also I, I've heard you speak really well and articulately about how you know, if science is sufficiently paradigm shifting, there's actually all sorts of resistance to that. Like you guys had this amazing discovery and journals are going to reject that before they even try and understand it. Um, and so, you know, how do we get into this predicament and where do we go from here for those who are really seeking truth through science? There are obstacles uh, that are put up. You know, there, there's a... Um, um, there's a natural tendency uh, that we have to seek truth. We're, we're curious people. We want to understand how nature works. And that's been true through the millennia. Um, it, but, but it seems to have vanished or it's vanishing progressively from the scene. And so you raise a good question, why? Why is that happening? The evidence that it is happening is if you ask yourself, um, how many scientific revolutions have, have there been uh, let's say in, in um, throughout your lifetime, your age, what, 30 or something? What? Yep, what? 36. 36, okay, 36. Um, I'm not supposed to ask that, but whatever, 36. So in 36 years, can you name, um, can you name a, a single scientific revolution, not a technological revolution, because there are lots of those, um, Zoom, for example, uh, you know, my laptop, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, but they're usually funded um, by investors who hope to get some dividend from their their investment. But I mean, I mean, fundamental scientific revolutions like the genetic code, um, uh, which which was was nineteen fifty something. I can't remember exactly. So, so that's. Uh, 70 years ago, or roughly, um, uh, or the splitting of the atom, that's maybe 80 years ago. I mean, those those are good examples to illustrate um, scientific revolutions. You know, we who knew um, and uh, that you could split an atom, or who knew about genetics? And um, so, so they impact everybody. Um, uh, so I'm asking, in in the past, uh, in the years of your young life um can you name name a scientific revolution of that magnitude that's a, impacted everybody's life can you do that i think there's one in process underway right now and it's yours but i i absolutely you're, you're very, hear what you're saying you're where it, <laughs> there i totally agree where you know our our equipment, our tooling, our resolution, they've all gotten so much better since that time yet we're not actually using that somehow to better discover and understand the world. Okay. Uh, so so you're getting to the reason why that's happened. And, you know, I have a hypothesis. And um, the hypothesis is that it's it's the system of doing science uh, that that does it. So let, let me let me expand on that. Um, you know, I'm an academic. I'm working at the University of Washington. Um, I've got a laboratory there, and I, um, a professor at um, at the university. And in order to do experiments, so I need to get money. The university gives me not a nickel. Um, in fact, they take uh, money because <laughs> you got to get a grant to get the money to hire the people to do the work. And the university lops off a certain fraction, uh, so-called overhead. You know, someone's got to pay for the lights and toilet paper. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, and 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 typically, if you get a grant, let's say from the National Institutes of Health, I, I've not gotten a grant for some time, so I don't know the current rate. But the university charges overhead fee, and the overhead is um, maybe sixty or seventy percent of the actual direct funding to my laboratory. So it's pretty substantial, and the university thrives on that. Uh, uh, you know, that's that's partly how they. Universities survive, but so think about 
think about um, the researcher, um, about the researcher who needs to get grant money um, in order to support the fundamental research that that's being done. So it's really important to do. Otherwise, you know, there's no bread on the table for your family. Could be, uh, depending on whether your salary comes from the university or in many cases from the granting agencies. So if you want to, if you want to keep that bread on your table, you you're really under pressure to get the grant. Now, there's a problem getting the grant. Of course, it's highly competitive, but I, the example that I always like to give uh, is um, uh, you, Zach. Okay, um, you have an idea which runs against the mainstream. You think the Earth is a sphere, but everybody around you, let's say, thinks it's flat. Okay. You know, I can look out my window here from, I'm at my home um, now in Seattle. I look out and I see Lake Washington and it's flat. It's absolutely flat, looks flat. And sometimes there are vast stretches of land that sort of look flat. And so it's not unreasonable to think that the earth is flat, at least, you know, if you don't know anything, anything more. But you, Zach, being a clever fellow, um, you, you, you think that the earth is actually a sphere. Okay, and and the reason you think it's a sphere is you've seen some photographs taken from satellites and from the moon, and hey, it looks like a sphere. Um, and there was no AI to distort at the time those <laughs> figures were <laughs> were generated. So so that was your first idea that the Earth the Earth could be a sphere because it looks like a sphere. And then you took off from uh, now you're in Vermont, but I I don't remember where you you were. Uh, but you took off from there and you went west and you wound up in Seattle. Um, and then from Seattle, you kept kept going west and you went so landed in Tokyo and then you went on further and you landed in London and you came back more, keep, keep going west and then you got to New York and then again back to your, your home in the middle of the, of the U.S. So you could circumnavigate the earth flying and get back to the same point. If the Earth is flat, that's impossible. So, so that's your second reason for thinking the Earth is round. So you're excited. You got this idea, and um, and you decide, okay, this is important enough. Everybody thinks the Earth is flat, and I think it's round. I think it's a sphere, and I really want to study this because if it's a sphere, it it just changes everything, um, uh, and so it's that important. And you put together a proposal and you submit it to the one of the granting agencies, let's say the National Science Foundation or or uh, whatever. And so Gatekeeper sees your application um, and says, hmm, this is this is a revolutionary idea, but I don't know Zach Weiss, who's who, who the hell is that guy? You know, and and um, I, I it's my duty, my absolute duty to to get the proper reviewers to find out whether this guy is a crackpot or you know maybe he has something reasonable to say so i as the gatekeeper will hire the experts in the shape of the earth who are the experts they're the flat earth people which means that your round earth idea is being judged by your opponent by flat earth uh, person by the experts in the in 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 the shape of the earth so what's your chance of getting funded? Approach is zero. They're going to say, well, you know, um, he, he, really, he really needs to specify how he's going to interpret his data and what kind of statistics he's going to use, blah, blah, blah. You know, anything to make sure that you don't get the money. And everybody's sitting around the review table, and it might be a dozen people or so. Um, they're mostly also flat earth people, and they're thrilled and delighted that the main reviewers find reason to challenge your idea. They don't want your idea to succeed. If your idea succeeds, they fail. So you're not going to get your money. Now, a lot of, a lot of people understand this, but they, scientists, but they don't understand um, how pervasive it is. So it means it's, it's a sort of a quieting effect uh, on people. You got a radical idea like the shape of the earth, but it's pretty risky because if you submit it, you're not going to get your money. And also, you're going to get a reputation pretty soon, Zach Weiss, oh, 
you know, he's that crackpot guy who comes up with these weird ideas. And uh, next time you apply for a grant, they're going to remember that. And so you're jeopardizing your entire career if you put in a proposal that the earth is round instead of flat. So now multiply that by every field in science. And you've got a situation where it it becomes um, very risky uh, uh, to propose an idea that challenges the prevailing idea. Um, and there you have it. And that's why there have been very few scientific revolutions uh, since since the granting agencies are the the ones that are are pervasive. Of course, there are there are other ways uh, or around the, uh, this, but I think this is this is the main reason why. Although it looks like science is making tremendous progress, it's all incremental, and it, it, it's all there's a lot of boasting that goes on uh, with the PR people at each university. They say, oh, Professor X has just found a possible cure for cancer. You know, it's not a cure for cancer. It's a possible cure for cancer. And, um, you know, they're going to tout all these findings, which, in fact, don't really amount to a whole lot, but it sounds good. And so the universities are in competition with one another and granting age and, and um, sorry, institute other research institutions they want the world to know that the, that their people are 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 really uh, uh, pushing the frontiers of science, but in fact, in all, almost all cases, they're not. So that's that's my take on the problem. If that makes sense. And there's a lot of self censorship that really happens as a result. And there's something there that I also see mirrored, especially in the water privatization industry, where you have decisions being made by people that are pretty far removed from the information needed to make that decision. And so in this case, you have these gatekeepers who are ultimately deciding if that radical idea gets funded or not, but they don't actually have the same knowledge base to make that decision. Same thing is happening very much so with water, where we have these decisions being made around how to maximize profits that aren't in connection with the people actually living on those landscapes. And so the situation for the people with the knowledge continues to get worse, while from afar, from a spreadsheet, this looks like a good decision. And I think same with the gatekeepers of science from afar, without all the information, it looks like a good decision because instead of deciding with the actual knowledge base, they're just deciding with the, a thin little line of information at the surface uh, that I think gets in the way of a lot of this innovation and positive work that could be happening otherwise. Well, I agree with you. And um, um, something needs to be done about it because we all, we all know, I mean, the world is facing an increasing a number of serious problems, and some of them, some of them could be solved uh, in the political realm, but some of them could also be solved in the scientific realm. You know, when you when you have a scientific revolution, which is really what we want in in science, if you have a, a, a revolution, it always leads to new technologies that you would never even have dreamed of. So, example, some guys working at Bell Telephone Laboratories uh, 80, 90 years ago discovered uh, semiconductors. They had no idea, uh, you know, what uh, it was fundamental science that they were doing. Um, and, you know, without without that finding, we would never have transistors, uh, we'd never have integrated circuits, we'd never have computers, et cetera, et cetera. They had no idea of what their finding would lead to, but, but um, it, you know, it, it brought, brought a lot. Um, and there, there are other other examples uh, um, of that. Um, for example, the finding of X-rays, uh, um, and, and nobody ever thought that you could do imaging with X-rays. And look what that's done for medical uh, diagnostics. So, so it happens regularly that if you have a scientific revolution, um, it it brings new technologies, uh, and the new technologies can solve problems, and. And I think there's nobody who would disagree that the world doesn't have problems. And some of those problems could be solved. Um, um, so so it's really important, the, the, the idea of um, promoting or restoring or developing a method that can produce scientific revolutions is of the utmost importance. Not widely realized, but I think 
really so important. And so science just, it kind of moseys on, um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of hype. In New York Times every day, now there's um, a section on science. It used to be once a week, I think, but there's so much that seems to be going on that it's necessary to have a, a special section on uh, on science. But but in in my own view, the science has not really led to any any serious revolutions, which is what we need. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and one of the things I really really appreciate about you is that you're a man of action. Uh, can you tell people about the Institute for Venture Science, what it is, and uh, what the vision is for it? You know, um, I will tell you in a moment, but I, I have to tell you an anecdote uh, for a moment. My, my late wife, she used to tell me, she said, Jerry, uh, you're running five careers simultaneously. And one of them was the Institute for Venture Science, and um, and um, if you don't. If you take on any more, I'm going to divorce you. Of course, you couldn't divorce me because although we were together 25 years, we never were officially married, so divorce is impossible. Uh, but I, I got the idea. And one of those is the Institute for Venture Science. There are also a lot of other things going on that take my time, and um, um, I'm very sensitive to to um, that uh, to the, the time because there's so much that I, I, I want to do. But... I felt a compelling interest uh, to create the Institute for Vent what became known as the Institute for Venture Science. And um, even in, in the field of muscle contraction, my former field, um, there was a dominant paradigm. And, um, and that paradigm, we had clear evidence that there was no way that that paradigm could be correct. The problem was that the paradigm was put forth by a um, a towering scientific giant, uh, Sir Andrew Huxley. Huxley. Huxley was a member of the famous Huxley family. Um, he won a Nobel Prize for his previous work on, on a channel, uh, on um, membranes. Uh, and um, he was president of the Royal Society, a master of Trinity College, Cambridge. And when he walked into the room, there was a hush. It was like God has entered the room. You couldn't challenge this guy, um, you know, but his theory was all wet. It's still all wet. It's still, it's pervasive all over, but it doesn't agree with the evidence. Um, I mean, it, it, there's a blatant disagreement with the evidence. Um, uh, maybe it's too, too far to consider it a non-starter, but there's just so much evidence that out of accord with that idea, but, but it came forth uh, from Sir Andrew Huxley. So, so we had been been battling, um, you know, with a formidable opponent uh, for quite a few years, and I wrote a book on muscle contraction in 1990, and I I explained all the the evidence and the reasons why why it it, it didn't agree, and and it started to come to me that um, uh, not only that experience in the field of muscle contraction, but experience later in the field of water where the same same principle applies you know three phases of water there, there's just too many anomalies too many things that are not explained and we usually sweep them under the rug thinking that sometime in the future someone will figure out how they actually do fit um, in the accepted paradigm but when the number grows so high you know you begin to wonder whether there's something fundamentally amiss with with that with that paradigm and having all these experiences uh, led me to um, to think seriously about the whole the whole system, and the thinking was um, enhanced by some work I did with the two major funding organizations, the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, and I I uh, participated at high level meetings. Um, with uh, the administrators of both of those organizations, and the idea, the idea was to do something, uh, uh, so, to institute some change in those organizations that, say, with five percent of their budget, that was devoted to revolutionary science. Um, so I was very active in doing that, and I think I actually my input made some progress. Uh, some programs were developed. And for a year or so, they seemed to be working, and then they reverted back to 
what they usually uh, do. So from that experience and my own experience and thinking about scientific revolutions and such, I decided to take the bull by the horns and do something. <laughs> um, so I spent uh, a year or two um, discussing various ideas back and forth with a whole bunch of colleagues, getting their input and, uh, um, uh, and massaging the ideas and finally came up with something. And that's something um, turned into an organization that's actually a 501c3, that's a, you know, a tax-free if you donate. It's called the Institute for Venture Science. And let me, let me just, before I go on a moment, the uh, URL, if anybody is interested, we, we could use donations. Uh, we're happy to receive them. It's called IV Science, Institute for Venture Science, IV, like in, like in intravenous, ivscience.org, not .com, .org. So feel free to contact. We would be interested in um, um, cooperating or particularly if some donation is possible. So the way it works, uh, let me just, since you asked me, let me see, tell you how it works. The first part, I'll summarize by saying, by saying the review, we, we, we ask for pre-proposals. It is a two-page proposal. So if you were interested in your round earth uh, proposal, you'd be submitting uh, two pages, and and that, those pages will be reviewed. And, and the reviewers are people who I've chosen, who I know are open-minded. And we would choose a couple of reviewers who are outside the field of the shape of the earth, because we know otherwise there would be a conflict of interest. And they review your application and they give it a rating based on, on, on uh, two features. Number one, is, is the revolutionary idea sound? according to their judgment. Um, uh, have you presented it enough to convince us that it it probably sounds? And second, um, does this guy, Zach Weiss or whomever, have the capacity to carry through what, what he thinks um, or not? And so you get a composite score. And um, in the first round, we, we had 200 of them and we picked 15 to submit full proposals. And the full proposals, uh, a little more extensive, uh, I think six or seven pages is, um, and uh, and there, not only uh, with uh, not only are you requested to produce a proposal, but you need to list a half dozen people um, who who uh, would object to your proposal. We go to those people, we ask them why they object. The next is an interview with you, uh, and we ask, we're we're going to ask you to respond to that critique from those people. If you respond well, then it's to your great advantage. Um, if you don't respond well, it's not to your advantage. Uh, if nobody comes through with challenging comments, then it's sort of neutral, but you know, uh, you're not really gaining anything. But, and then you get a, re a review score. So so it's, it's, a, it's pretty extensive. I would say it's a more extensive review than any review I know of by any organization, we we, we don't want crackpots. <laughs> we want revolutionary scientists, and so um, um, so we picked out actually five um, uh, uh, of those, and we're we need we're about to fund one of them, the highest ranking one, and uh, we need additional funds from uh, private donors. But so but. The one critical point, which I haven't mentioned, is this. Uh, what What is our plan? If you get funded, uh, Zach Weiss on Round Earth, um, you're not going to succeed. Uh, why are you not going to succeed? Because all the Flat Earth people are going to gang up and say, oh, Zach Weiss, he's a crackpot. Uh, don't pay any attention to him. And once you're labeled a crackpot by enough people, it's hard for you to recover from that you will not succeed, no matter how much money we give you to pursue your, your ex experiments. So to remedy that, we're gonna fund not only you, but we're gonna fund up to a dozen other laboratories around the world who also think that the earth, you know, that flat earth, something wrong with it, maybe the earth is, is round. And they're gonna study it by their own methods. You use your method, they study by their methods. And next year, at the annual meeting of the Shape of the Earth Society, 
uh, there are going to be a dozen people who come and they're going to report that, no, the earth is not flat, the earth is round. And and the young people who are coming to that, their eyes will be wide open. You know, we never heard of such a thing. It's amazing. And a dozen different laboratories, each one using a different method, comes to the same result. Um, my prediction is it won't take more than two or three years before there's a scientific revolution. Um, and that's the idea. That's the central idea of the Institute for Venture Science. Um, we need we need funds. Uh, we're we're developing uh, various uh, marketing videos because we haven't done much of that, and because I don't have time. Otherwise, my um, late wife will divorce me, <laughs> so to speak. You know. Uh, so so um, um, you know. And we we've actually tried this out on a whole bunch of uh, different different people and. There's a lot of enthusiasm over the idea. It's just that we need more money to implement it properly. So thank you for asking. Um, Absolutely. And a, just that's such a smart, clever way to start to unravel the challenges ahead of us. And so I really just commend you for thinking all of that out and not just setting up people for immediate success with their work, but for long-term success in the field. I think that so important. Um, and so folks in, in the webinar, I put the link in the chat. Uh, please go there, share it with people. You know, projects like this need more funding to actually move things forward. And so it's really important that we support these really important endeavors uh, that are helping to revolutionize science, really. Um, so right. I've got I, you know, I would love to just keep you here all day, Gerald, but um, I, I've got a few more questions and then we'll open it to the audience for a few and then start wrapping up. So okay. folks, put your question in the question and answer um, as we're going through uh, these last few and then I'll pull out a few. Um, but one of the things that I really want to pick your brain about selfishly here is that when we're building water landscapes, we're doing a lot of things to create biofilters. And so these biofilters are essentially areas where water is moving through rock, gravel, sand, basically a natural waterway, a creek, um, whether we're moving water around or circulating it through these we see time and time again, whether it's for a healthy aquatic system or a natural swimming pool, these biofilters are very effective at cleaning up water. Uh, now they're providing some vortexing, there is thought to be some biological actions, but the more I learn about easy water, the more that I think it has a role in this process because we're essentially creating a lot. I wonder, are there any thoughts that you have from your observations and learnings uh, that we might want to consider in terms of the function of these biofilters and, and what might help enhance them or different things that we might want to avoid? Well, I, I have no expertise in this, but I, you know, I have a few ideas and the thoughts that could conceivably be relevant. Um, so one, one of the thoughts is that by, when the water passes through um, these uh, uh, surfaces, if the surfaces are hydrophilic, water loving, and there's plenty of infrared energy around, um, they're going to build easy water. And um, 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 and so the easy water excludes, um, but um, wh where where the excluded debris, so to speak, winds up, I, you know, I'm I'm not sure, but I do know that that. Um, you know, for plants that grow, easy water is critically important, as important as it is um, for us. Uh, our cells are filled with easy water, which in fact is the main theme of our, our one of the main themes of our research, that our cells, our cells need to be filled with easy water for them to function properly. Um, uh, and the same is true in plants, um, that they need to be filled with easy water. So, so if the if the water is flowing past these surfaces and meandering and such, um, they're going to pick up um, the some of the easy water that that grows on the surface of of, uh, of those substances through which it's passing, and, um, um, and and some of the easy as the water flows, 
it will erode some of the EZ that would stick to say the rocks and you get EZ water in the flowing in the flowing water uh, see and and we know that um that that's that's really good for uh, for the health of the plants for example the farmers um I, I've spoken to have always maintained that they'd much rather have rainwater compared to irrigation water and rainwater contains EZ uh, this is another topic that we haven't we haven't gotten to, but uh, my book that's coming out um, soon um, in the next few months deal, deals deals with um, um, uh, many issues of our environment and and the idea that that many of these these uh, processes that happen in our environment um, depend on easy water. One of them is weather, for example, and. I spent four chapters on uh, on that, and I attempt to go from from fundamental principles up to hurricanes, starting with the basics and leading up. How do you how do you explain it? I haven't seen any anything like that uh, ever, but you know it may be my limited um, exposure. Uh, but I try I try to to do that, and so it turns out that the raindrops that fall and um, um, they're actually water and uh, surrounded by uh, like onion layers, onion skin layers of EZ water, um, and and um, and so they fall on <laughs> on the soil, and and there you have EZ, and EZ contains energy, uh, and it's important for plant growth. And I've I've seen or heard from perhaps a dozen different agricultural uh, people who who maintain that that some kind of structured water uh, is good for the growth of plants and rain is one of those because it contains structured or easy water so so that's what i i guess that's how i would uh, respond to your question and in terms of you know of our health and what one of the one of the approaches that's highly recommended um is to to um, uh, so-called uh, juice, that is going to your backyard, taking some some of the leaves of some freshly grown plants, squeeze them, get the water out or the stuff and drink it. And that seems to be an expedient way of gaining health almost no matter what your problem is. It's highly touted and I, I used to drink it myself when my wife would would uh, prepare it. Um, and, and um, doesn't taste great, but if you add a little something to it, and, but what are, what are we drinking? So inside the plant cells, freshly grown plant cells is full of easy water. So you're squeezing out the easy water and we're drinking easy water and we need easy water for our cells. And if our cells are deficient in some way and therefore uh, dysfunctional or even pathological, we drink that water, it restores the easy and brings us back toward proper function. So. So yeah, so I'm, you know, I I don't know if I've exp if I've answered your your question exactly. Um, I don't know about water filters. People ask me almost daily. I get emails saying, oh, oh, by the way, can you tell me which is the best filter? And I have to say, you know, I try to respond to every email I receive, and it's a real burden, I must say. Uh, but I have to say, respond to them saying, I'm sorry, we have no experience testing water filters. So anyway, I hope that sort of answers your question. Yeah, that was great. And that that's a great tease for your upcoming book. I can't wait to read that myself. Um, people are asking, what's the name of the new book? Do you have a name yet? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's called, the main title is Charged. Um, and then the second part, if I have it right, the, the uh, unexpected role of electricity in the workings of nature, and in in the, and it'll be it'll be out in about four months. I uh, I hope uh, it's almost done. Uh, it's being laid out now, um, and and it deals it deals with with uh, um, a variety of different aspects of nature and how electricity is unexpectedly important. And one of them is weather. I imagine another one is gravitation. Another one is wind. How do you get wind? What's the genesis of of wind? Uh, another one is uh, how birds fly. 
you know, we will all say, well, they flap their wing, but I look out the window and I see eagles flying up, down, level, whatever, without any wing flapping <laughs> all the time. Um, so there's something else that's involved. I talk about uh, how fish swim. Uh, again, the methods, the mechanisms that have been suggested don't make real sense. Um, there's something else going on. So I deal uh, even with sailboats, some sailboats like... Um, ice boats, which are sailboats that sail on ice, and they go 100 miles an hour into the wind, almost directly into the wind. And so it's like like I'm pushing you and you're moving toward me instead of away from me. Um, how does that work? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is wild. So, so um, yeah, uh, there are a lot of sort of colorful things in the book. Uh, I have no idea what the reaction is going to be, but all the mechanisms are are mechanisms that I, I think make sense, uh, but I have no idea what the reaction is going to be. Uh, that's awesome. I, I cannot wait to read that myself. Very much looking forward to it. And we'll be sure to let everyone know in the community when it comes out and where to find it. Uh, oh, thank you. So yeah, very much looking forward to that. Um, I wonder as a, a last question for me, and then we'll pick a few of uh, our audience Q and A's here and wrap up. Um, but I wonder, you know, this is obviously a, a really big topic. Um, and so it, feel free to take this wherever you want to and, and don't feel like you have to cover everything in it. Uh, but this process of cloud formation and of water in the atmosphere, it's still so poorly understood in a way and you know having a few close connections in the climate modeling community they are just pulling their hair out over clouds and water vapor and the new models are now less accurate even though they're now accommodating for the clouds and so i wonder and this sounds like a, a good tease for your book as well um, if you could share a bit on how you think this fourth phase of water, what kind of impacts that might have on cloud formation and on the weather cycles that we experience? Uh, well, you know, you have a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let, let me let me just say a couple of things about clouds. Um, um, the fir first question uh, or the first issue um how to, how to respond to this question. The first issue is we see clouds in the sky, right? And um, and the question is, why why are the clouds in the sky? Uh, the clouds consist of little droplets of water, um, and they sometimes uh, they'll come down as rain. But, you know, I look out my window and I see those clouds there, but it's not raining. And um, if they're a little, the cloud consists of little droplets, um, what keeps them up? Because if you went up, if you took a tall ladder uh, that could reach all the way up to the level of the clouds and you took a pitcher of water and you turned it over, the water would come down and hit me on the head, right? Uh, so there are little droplets and all these droplets are heavier than air. How come, how come the clouds remain suspended in the air, right? That's something perhaps you haven't thought about, but it's a, it's a really, important question uh, right and um and the answer to that i i, I believe is actually not complicated it's um, but there is a lot of background that you need to come to this conclusion is that the, the clouds are negatively charged and the earth is negatively charged so they repel okay so that that's you know re requires elaboration and background and i we we don't have uh, the time here to to go into that, but in the book I do. Uh, that's the first thing. And now next thing is I look at the clouds there and I can't tell if it's going to rain or not rain. Um, in Seattle, we have a lot of clouds, especially in the winter time. And sometimes they unleash their contents and sometimes they don't. Who turns on the rain? <laughs> where's, where's the switch? Completely unknown, right? Uh, nobody understands it. And I, I deal with that in the book. Um, and the answer is actually surprisingly straightforward, but but maybe less than obvious. So um, I did an interview uh, once with a, a guy who was in the atmospheric science field. And during a break in the interview, um, he whispered to me, he said, you know, in our field, um, there are two things we don't understand. 
one is evaporation and the other is cloud formation. Um, and um, from another person, and it's true, uh, and from another person, I heard that what's going on in the field of atmospheric science um, is uh, very little physics, chemistry, and mostly computer models. We all want to know, should I take an umbrella to work tomorrow or not? You know, and and as you say, the the models, the models are you know they're mostly based on on history, historical patterns. So uh, you 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 measure the temperatures and pressures and whatever that exists now, and compare it to those that existed um, uh, over the years, and then you can sort of predict what might happen. Sometimes it works; it doesn't always work. There's almost nothing on the physics and chemistry of what happens uh, with weather and clouds. And um, and because of that, you know, the the, the issue of a global warming and pattern, weather pattern changes, it's almost impossible to uh, figure out what's going on if you don't understand the, the fundamental underlying principles. I hope in this book that I'm able to um, um, make, I, I, I guess, I hope that what I, I have been producing or produced makes some sense and helps in that vein. Uh, going further is maybe too much for, for this interview, but I, I hope you'll read the book and, and see if you agree or disagree uh, uh, with what I put forth. Yeah. That's perfect. Awesome. That's a perfect answer. Um, now, I wonder, I'm just going to try and combine a few of these questions together. Um, and a lot of people are asking, I think you've spoken to this a little bit, but maybe you could just uh, elaborate that, um, and this is maybe a multi-parted question, but uh, you know, how strict are the conditions for this easy water to form? How present is it in nature? And are there any studies being done with its effects on plants or how this might be applicable to agriculture? Well, uh, um... For the second uh, um, part, part of the question, I uh, I mentioned earlier. I you know I haven't kept track, uh, but I I get emails from people uh, talking about using some kind of structured water, easy water, fourth phase water, just so called structured water, and uniformly they say it makes a really a, a major difference in plant growth. So. Um, yeah, I think it's important. I, I I wish I had kept track, but you know, I pass this on to some people who might use the information. Um, we we don't we don't engage in any kind of uh, commercial ac activity. We we had a startup company for a few years, but we don't we don't have that anymore. And our our focus is on the fundamentals of nature and science. So so I since we don't do it, I pass on the information to others, and I just don't keep track of it. But I can say that that I, I've heard from from many people, many meaning you know like perhaps a, a dozen or so. I I can't recall uh, that easy water is great for plant health, and I, I I can understand why because plants are so similar to animals, and we we need we need that kind of water um, in our cells for our cells to function. And by the way, I deviate from. Uh, just a little bit from from your question, you know, um, most most books um, say that the cell biology books, for example, say that the cell is filled with liquid water. They don't talk about anything else. But but the way you can you can actually find out um, whether there's liquid water in your cells um, requires a bit of bravery. So you you take a razor blade. And you run it down your arm. And um, so you know what happens. Blood comes out. But surprisingly, water doesn't come out. <laughs> and um, so you'd expect if the cells were filled with liquid water, the liquid water would come pouring out like a breach in a water pipe. But it doesn't happen. Even surgeons have told me, I have a couple of surgeon friends, and they, they've told me that they can cut deep in the abdomen like they cut through a muscle, right through the belly of the muscle water doesn't come out. You know, you might expect the water to come out, but it doesn't come out. And that, that's because the easy water is a gel, and the gel sticks to the solids inside the cell, and so it doesn't come out. 
um, um, so you know it's it's and uh, the same is true in plants. Um, um, I I can't remember um, cutting open a plant, but uh, you probably are more familiar with that. But I think the water doesn't come pouring out. <laughs> um, it, you know, and it's so you have this yeah exactly gel like easy water, highly viscous that stays inside. It sticks. It's like raw egg white. You know, raw egg white. Everybody is is familiar with that. It's a gel, and it's a cytoplasm of the egg cell. So your cytoplasm presumably is very much like the egg cytoplasm, and it's a gel. It's a gel because easy water is has a gel-like consistency. No, I'm sorry, I deviated from the question, and I can't remember what. No, that was that was perfect. You covered it well. Okay. Um, and then I think this will be our last question, and then we'll we'll let you share any closing thoughts that you'd like to, Gerald. Um, but a lot of people are asking about temperature and easy water in the exclusion zone and how the strength or charge of the exclusion zone changes with fluctuations in temperature or relates to temperature. And I know you found some really interesting stuff with regards to temperature and freezing in this fourth phase of water. Yeah, so we did we did studies early on, although we we never got to publishing them. And um, so first we raised the temperature, and we found that with increases of temperature, the easy grew a little smaller. Not it was not a dramatic effect, but that's what we found. When we reduced the temperature, at um, the the easy began to grow, and the growth. Uh, from room temperature downward was not dramatic, but as we got to lower and lower temperatures, the EZ grew more and more. And um, and when the temperature got low enough, that EZ converted into ice. We found later in, in subsequent studies that in order to produce ice from liquid water, you can't. You have to go through the intermediate step of EZ formation. Uh, so you reduce the temperature, easy forms, it grows, and the easy turns into ice. Easy structure and ice structure are not the same, but they're similar. They both have hexagonal motifs. And um, and and we what we found is that that actually clears up some of the mysteries of ice formation. Um, there are thermodynamic mysteries, which I don't need to go into at, at the moment, and you know, scientists have been scratching their heads to, to come up, come up with understandings and interpretations, and that's been formidable. But uh, this provides, I, I think, a clarifying mechanism um, for for how ice forms. The same thing when ice melts; it doesn't melt directly into into uh, liquid water. It melts first into easy water and then into liquid water. So the easy is a necessary intermediate. Uh, necessary intermediate between ice and, and and water. You can actually see that. Um, 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 so, um, or you can see the the melting uh, uh, of ice. So I remember seeing it in Austria, uh, at Innsbruck, where uh, there's fresh ice ice melt. Also the same in British Columbia. The water from the fresh ice melt is is green. Um, uh, pretty consistently green, and then it turns uh, pretty much colorless. Why is it? Why is it green? Well, it turns out we we showed uh, that easy water fluoresces, and it generally fluoresces in the blues and greens, depending on uh, the ambient uh, ambient light. Um, and uh, and so I think it's uh, this fluorescence, uh, this green color shows this fluorescence and, and shows that this water contains a lot of uh, of easy water. Um, so that's just, uh, you might say, anecdotal, but I think interesting. That is fascinating. And having spent a lot of time, you know, by glaciers and in these places where there are these wild colors, you wouldn't necessarily expect. That's a really interesting possible explanation. Well, yeah, I, I think you know, others talk about minerals um, um, causing it, but you know it's not so clear how minerals cause it because you can put minerals in water and the water doesn't turn color uh, usually, ex except in a few unusual, unusual cases. Um, yeah, I mean like modest amounts of uh, of mineral, but but um, yeah, we we documented this fluorescence. Um, um, 
So, okay, I think that yeah, your question, yeah. That's perfect. And this has been such a great webinar. Really appreciate you taking the time to share all of this with us, Gerald. Uh, really appreciate everyone who joined us today. Uh, everyone's going to get a replay. So uh, don't worry, you'll be able to watch this a bunch of times and fully digest all of the, the information that Gerald shared here. I'm going to pop in the chat uh, the links for Gerald's work. And then we're also going to send out when it's available uh, the details for Gerald's new book, which is going to be fascinating. I can almost guarantee it. Um, Gerald, any final thoughts you want to share with folks as we wrap up today? Uh, yeah, there are, uh, I guess, a, a, a couple. The first is that our own lab um, could use some donations. Uh, uh, this is completely independent of the Institute for Venture Science uh, Um and um, we, we've, we've been struggling. It's really hard for reasons that we've discussed to get money from, from funding organizations. Uh, yet, I, I think there's so much promise that lies ahead that we'd like to continue. And if anybody knows someone with deep pockets um, um, who would like to contribute in a meaningful way, that please connect us uh, to to that person we really would be grateful for anything that's that's received because there's so much to do and we can't do it without without the support the second um and in my email anybody can find it it's all over <laughs> ghp at uw.edu um uh, i guess the sec second thing is uh, is it has to do has to do with uh, uh, creativity. I can only uh, only suggest that um, those of you who are open minded um, uh, um, would would um, would would take any kind of uh, um, open minded or revolutionary research and really give a due consideration and tell your friends about it. Um, there, there needs to be a kind of revolution. Um, to achieve a scientific revolution, we're heading in the wrong direction right now, and I, 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 I'm really hoping we can revert because there's so much, so much that we don't know. And many people say, "Oh, we, we, um, we, we know just about everything." I, I once did a survey. I went to the cafeteria with my clipboard, and I asked, "Of all, of all the fundamental understanding that there can be in nature, how much of it do we understand today?" And uh, I got the the responses were binary. Um, uh, many of the people, some of the people said, "Oh, much less than one percent." <laughs> In other words, <laughs> there's a vast arena of uh, unknowns to be tackled. And the surprise came when uh, the people, mostly in the sort of medical research community, um, said to me, "Oh, maybe two thirds or seventy percent." I couldn't believe that because. My own belief system is that we know so little of of what there is eventually to learn. So, I guess my message is keep an open mind and um, and talk about this with your friends and colleagues about keeping an open mind and, and keeping an open attitude to new ideas instead of rejecting them out of hand. So, I guess I'll close with that. That's awesome. That's a, a great place to leave it. It reminds me of uh, one of my mentors, Sepp Holzer's, my favorite quotes from him. What we know is a drop. What we don't know is the rest of the ocean. 